you can take seats, please. Good morning. Thank you for the people that have prayed for the dry weather. God obviously loves you, so that's great. Keep praying. Um, John Wright, who leads the, uh, he's actually the national director of the Vineyard. Uh, he spoke the other week and he talked about one of the things he's learned from the pandemic is that he used to preach for 40 minutes at Trent Vineyard. And one of the things he's discovered is that people won't tolerate a 40 minute sermon any longer. <laughs> You'll be pleased to know my sermon is going to be about four minutes because of the weather. Not that, because I just don't have enough faith. Um, I don't know if I say the level of faith that you guys have got. I can just see, just see it just beginning to come. Um, but we have, we, last week on YouTube, we started to talk a little bit about vineyard values. And people were a bit like, well, what, is, what are vineyard values? What are we talking about? Anytime you go to a vineyard church and there are over 100, um, 100 and something in the UK, but there's over 2,000 across the globe. And the idea is that you could walk into any vineyard church and experience uh, similar priorities and values that underpin that particular denomination. Uh, you would find values and priorities in all kinds of denominations, but what is it, what is it that makes vineyards unique? What is the essence of a vineyard church? And the vineyard has a wealth of priorities and values. We're not going to go through every single one. Uh, but they form the vineyard movement or the vineyard tribe or the vineyard family. So you should walk into a vineyard church and, and you just kind of sense that, oh yeah, it feels, it feels like a vineyard. And really the values and the priorities are the things that they're often unseen. They're not often very, very overt, but they define the flavor or the emphasis of what we then build upon. So the things that we do are shaped by our values. So the values kind of inform who we are as uh, Christians, mini Jesuses, but also what we then prioritise in church life. So some people, uh, Dave, you know, obviously bangs on about money all the time. That's a joke because he doesn't. But uh, when you give your money, uh, when you offer your time, when you come with your energy and your enthusiasm, what do, you, what do you put those things into or the things that we place value on? So values and priorities in a vineyard church and hopefully that you have experienced at some point in this vineyard or in other vineyards that you might have visited might include things like intimate worship that we've just experienced. So, you know, you can, you can connect with God, you can sense the Holy Spirit. Yes, God, you're here. You're alive and well. You haven't fallen off of your throne in this season. That intimate worship, that sense of being open to the Holy Spirit, that yes, we might have plans, we might do this, we might do that, but actually it's God's church. If the Holy Spirit does this, then we are open to that. It may sound ridiculous, but a value is having a relationship with God. That sounds crazy, saying that in a church. But um, Dave and I have experienced times where we have met ministers, ministers who are not saved. A relationship with God is actually a priority in a vineyard church. And then relationship with each other taking care of each other, looking out for each other, and that builds meaningful community. And we want to have a church that's healthy. And there might be times that we have uh, started a particular idea, and then if it's not healthy, we might have stopped it. And a good gardener will tell you that uh, every now and then you have to prune things back. So if they're not healthy, you prune it back, and then healthy growth starts to come again. There's just, they, they're just a few examples. Now, last week, if you watched our YouTube service, we talked about one of the values is having that real pursuit of God, having that deep, meaningful, vital relationship with God. And that's a key value, because if you don't have a relationship with God, then actually everything that comes after that is pretty pointless. So having that pursuit with God, and we talked about maybe doing that through worship, having time 
uh, in community with each other, praying, reading the Bible. I talked about the uh, the app that's about um, Bible in one year, which for me has been an absolute saving grace, things like that. Um, one of the values that I'm just going to literally talk about for a couple of minutes, so I was getting his phone out, it's been timely. <laughs> He's checking Facebook, yeah. Um, one of the values that we uh, hold dear, particularly here, is practicing grace and mercy. Actually understanding what that is and modelling that um, in our lives within the church community and beyond. So grace and mercy, what am I talking about? Because they can sound a little bit like religious words. If you think about grace, grace is the help that is given to us by God because he wants us to have it. He wants us to have help as we live out our lives. And it's not because we've earned it. There are other religions where you earn favour. You earn your way to heaven. You earn your way kind of up the religious tree, if you like. Grace is help given by God, and we do not earn it. We don't deserve it. It's the grace of God. He is our helper, comforter, counsellor. Mercy is compassionate treatment of someone or of a situation. So essentially having the capacity to show kindness to someone, to show forgiveness to someone. And it could be particularly when they don't deserve your kindness. So someone might have wronged you and yet you show mercy. You show that extra bit of kindness, that extra bit of forgiveness. Why do we do that? Because God's already done it to us. He has already done it to us. We have been shown mercy, therefore we show mercy. We have the grace of God poured on, on us, so God helps us, so we help each other. That's a value in this church, so that helps build relationship with God, with each other, it builds a meaningful community, it helps us to be healthy. That's the idea of it. We hold these values dear, but we are broken individuals and we live in a broken world. And sometimes we can forget these values or we start to be selective with these values. Yeah, I'll show grace and mercy to them because they're nice people. What? That completely nullifies what grace and mercy is. You show grace and mercy regardless of who God puts in front of you. And it could be someone who absolutely does not deserve it. But how powerful is that when you show grace and mercy to someone who doesn't deserve it? But then it's understanding that none of us deserve it. None of us have, we haven't worked hard enough, we're not good enough to be shown the amazing grace and mercy that God shows us on a daily basis, hour by hour. It talks in the Bible about his mercies are new every morning. You might have arrived this morning and yesterday you did something terrible. God's mercies are new for you this morning. You might have got up this morning and just, you know, had a terrible row in the car on the way here. God's mercy is available right now for you. Jesus says, um, you know, his famous sermon, Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. Jump forward in the New Testament and in Romans 12, it says, therefore, this is uh, Paul talking, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, 
offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This, this, in view of God's mercy, this is proper worship. If you offer yourself before God and say, here I am, God, use me. That's the value that we have. Paul wrote to Timothy. So Timothy was a young leader, just kind of working out what this whole leadership thing was about. And Paul said this to him, I thank Jesus who has given me strength that he has considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man and a murderer, I was shown mercy. I acted in ignorance and unbelief. I was shown mercy and the grace of God was poured out on me abundantly. That's Paul. Paul, the worst of the worst of the worst, talks about grace and mercy. And they're the things that made him the servant he is because he understood that he was saved by God, not because of how good he was, but because of how bad he was. It was the grace and mercy. It's a value that we hold dear in this church. And there'll be lots of people that you will encounter who will upset you in and out of church. There'll be people that you meet at work who will really annoy you and your natural urge is to punch them. Grace and mercy. Grace and mercy. Because Jesus talks about us being salt and light, being the difference, being the person that people look at and go, wow, there's something different about them. What is it? It's you showing grace and mercy to people. That is contagious. That's attractive. We've lived in a world for the last year plus where we are sick about hearing things that are contagious. But let's be something that is really wonderfully contagious. Let's be contagious Christians by showing grace and mercy to people who do not deserve it. Because we don't deserve it. Grace and mercy the whole time. That's it. It is as simple as that and as difficult as that. Because grace and mercy here, you think, oh, that's so nice, until you have to do it. <laughs> until you actually have to show that mercy on someone who's just hit your car, who's just cut you up at the lights, who's just diddled you out of money, who's just taken the promotion that you deserved, who jumped ahead of you on the queue for the next whatever it might be, check out. What's it like when you actually have to put it into practice? Theory is brilliant. Practice is harder. So my challenge to you this week is when people annoy you, because they will, they absolutely will, someone will annoy you this week, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to react? Grace and mercy? Or not? That's up to you. But as a, as a church, we try and model that. And as a value, we try and use that again and again and again because we're flawed Christians and we need it. So we're going to pray and we're going to take communion. Here's my question to you. Is there anyone that you bring that is just in your mind at the moment that you think, actually, I wasn't very nice to that person. I'm harboring horrible thoughts about them. In my fantasy world, I'm harming them. Are there people that in your heart you need to show them my mercy? If that's the case, just bring them to mind and just say, God, help me. Please help me, God.
that person who's hurt me. And you might need to do it through gritted teeth. God, please help me to begin to want to forgive them, to show them mercy. Just examine your heart for a minute. Lord, you have shown me incredible mercy. On a daily basis, you give me the grace to live this life. Help me to be a contagious Christian and to show that grace and mercy to others. I had the picture of um, Platform 9 and 3 quarters uh, when Laura was speaking on the Harry Potter books. Uh, and God was just saying to me about, you know, this is called the drama block. And it just that phrase has been going through my head all morning about, you know, drama block, drama block. It's a really dramatic day for us, not knowing what was going to happen. And that could have been a block. Uh, I just felt God say to me, you know, well, what was the, what was the problem, Dave? The rain stayed off, everything was fine. Um, so why didn't it have to be a drama? I feel some of you also are carrying drama in your life. Um, and, you know, that's very um, usual in current circumstances, that, you know, drama is a real part of what we've had to live with, but it doesn't have to be a block. You know, when Harry goes towards the, the big pillar on platform nine, a platform, pretty nine, platform nine and ten, he goes straight through, doesn't he? It looks like a brick wall. But actually go through and I felt God was saying, lift, give, just lifting that off us. If you're going through a drama, don't think it's going to be a blockage to what he wants to do. Look forward and not backwards. Uh, we're going to take communion now. Uh, if you can just indulge me and keep two metres distance just for one more time, that would be lovely. Uh, just because we want to make sure we've crossed every T and dotted every I. Uh, so as you approach the table, just keep a little bit of distance from the family that isn't yours. Uh, take a, um, a little bag of bread. And it's a little cup of grape juice you can pull off the seal and you can go and sit down with that. Uh, and if you want to do that, you're very welcome to. You don't have to if you don't want to. Uh, if you want to wait for your kids to come back and do it with them, that's no problem at all. Uh, but if you want to do that now while Dave plays, that would be fantastic. Go and help yourself to bread and grape juice. Uh, and just remember kind of why we're doing this. You know, it's remembering something happened 2,000 years ago that still has relevance to us today, that we're here, we're standing here, we're worshipping God after two of the most traumatic years in our life, and we're still praying and knowing that he can change things, he holds the future, and he controls things. I'm just going to invite the presence of God to be here even more. Increase your presence here, God. Lord, we invite you to mend our broken hearts. where we need your grace, where we need your mercy. Just remind us, God, that it is freely given by you. It's freely available. Many of you may have heard the uh, image. It was a vision that um, John Wimber had. John Wimber started the vineyard. And he had a vision of a huge honeycomb superimposed uh, kind of in the sky and it was dripping on people. And some people were irritated by it because it was sticky and interrupting their hurriedness. Whereas some people were standing there just holding out their hands and scooping it up and just enjoying it. And John said to the Lord, what is that? What is that, God? And he said, it's my mercy. And it's available for all. You just have to hold out your hands and get it. 
And so I just pray that if you are in need of mercy, if you're in need of God's help, his grace, that you would hold out your hands because it is available for you. And there might be particular situations that you are faced with and you cannot solve it by yourself. And you need his grace and you need his mercy. And I pray for those situations that are difficult for you this morning. And I pray that God's incredible provision would be available for you. And that this week you would see a change. pray that God would lift worry off of people this morning. Worry and anxiety. That you would experience God's peace, that you would not be robbed of peace this morning. And there's a couple of people here this morning. I just have a sense that you haven't yet seen you haven't yet seen him answer your prayer and you're wondering if he's even heard you and that you would know this morning that god has god has heard your prayers and not a single prayer is wasted it's never wasted Uh, Carolyn, I feel like the Lord wants to just surprise you with some new things. That there's a new season coming for you and just to be really excited and just where maybe you just feel a bit um, disappointed and a bit battle weary. I just feel like God wants to surprise you with some new wonderful things. And I pray that he would fill you with hope and expectation. And Sarah, that you would know the incredible uh, authority that you carry and that you do show grace to people. I know that we joke that you feel like you don't, but you do. You show incredible grace to people. But when you speak, you carry authority as well. 